Uh, One more. Uh, I had to walk almost two oh, miles. We, we can hear you. Nice. Can you hear us? Yes. yes. Good morning. Morning. So, uh, dear participants, uh, today we'll listen how you solve your problems and how you manage your projects. But as a conclusion, for our campus, we have the great opportunity to know how the, one of the most effective and innovative uh, companies in the world uh, do, the, do that. Uh, we'll talk about Boeing uh, case. And we have Sergei Kravchenko, president of Boeing Russia, with us. So please welcome Sergei to our, to our lecture. And uh, we'll have a short lecture, and then uh, you will have opportunity to ask your questions. Sergei, the stage is yours, please. Well, first of all, you know, I want to apologize, you know, for being late. Moscow uh, this summer is under major reconstruction downtown, and uh, I had to walk almost three miles uh, uh, to make it. You know, I started very early, but uh, the streets are blocked this morning, so I apologize. So uh, we are going to talk about uh, modernization and innovation, and uh, let me just say a few words about myself and about my company. So next shot, please. Uh, so we will talk today about uh, something that you read, you know, in uh, in newspapers that you heard, you know, in your classes. And I hope that after today's lecture, uh, these words, modernization, outsourcing, growth, uh, managing risks, uh, diversification, will mean our uh, something real for you because I'm going to give you real life examples. Next shot, please. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the company. So the company celebrated last Friday uh, 100 years young. So I actually came from Seattle this uh, weekend uh, and uh, on uh, July 15th, Bill Boeing in 1916 created a company that probably uh, contributed uh, more than any other corporations in the world uh, to the major changes. This is a company that uh, invented jet aviation that created some of the most sophisticated uh, systems uh, for defense and security. This is the company that in the United States was leading the space exploration and today it's 186,000 people all over the world uh, leading uh, aerospace industry. Next shot, please. So we have 20,000 suppliers. Uh, last year we were almost $100 billion company. And uh, actually uh, the number here, uh, 160,000 people is 2015 uh, number. Uh, as of today we have 186,000 people and we work in almost uh, every large country of the world. Next chart. So uh, before I will go into the company structure, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. So I was born and raised in Moscow in the academic family and uh, I was a professor at the Soviet and later Russian Academy of Sciences. And then I was teaching in Stockholm at the Royal Institute of Technology and uh, consulting the Samsung company in South Korea. In 1992, right after Soviet Union collapsed, the Boeing company decided to go into Russia and cooperate in the areas of aviation and space. And I left academic life, which I really liked, and I became a manager. And in the last 25 years, you know, next year I will celebrate 25 years uh, with the company. I grew in the company from a first level manager to the senior vice president and in 2002, I came back from the United States after almost seven years working in Seattle. Uh, and we created a really big presence for the Boeing company in the former Soviet Union, both in Russia and in Ukraine. Uh, today, uh, today, we have about uh, 2,500 people only in Russia working for Boeing, designing airplanes, uh, writing software, doing research and development. We have three joint ventures and we manufacture uh, really big parts and components for our commercial aeroplanes. In Urals at uh, our joint venture with Russian technology, Rostech and Lesampo Avisma, 
and Boeing also is the main integrator together with Energia or the International Space Station. So, you know, we can proudly say that today Boeing is probably the largest uh, high technology investor into Russia. But I'm going to talk today a little bit about uh, two cases that I had an opportunity to live through. One case is uh, probably one of the largest examples in the world of the modernization. And the second case is uh, um, a failure and success in a dramatic um, move to innovation. So we will talk about two airplanes that probably you all heard about or many of you flew on. We will talk about Boeing 737 airplane, our most popular narrow body airplane, and we will describe the case of modernization. And then I will tell you the story of 787 Dreamliner, uh, and we will talk about uh, innovation uh, using this airplane. I had an opportunity to work uh, at the Boeing company in engineering, in supply management, in uh, sales, marketing, and also in uh, corporate. Uh, and uh, I personally participated on two aeroplane programs, Boeing 777 and uh, Boeing 787. So if you look at the Boeing company today, we have very strong two business units. One is uh, um, working on commercial aeroplanes and the other one is working on defense, space and security. And we have very strong corporate uh, structures uh, from engineering to international and lower we rotate people vertically and horizontally, and uh, this is a pretty strong matrix of the company that helps the company to survive uh, business and other storms. Next chart, please. Hey, can you hear me well? You know, if you can hear me well, do like this. Okay, great. So if something will go wrong, somebody gives me a signal, okay, and I will... Uh, either speak louder or we will fix the um, technology. So this is the guy whom I probably learned from more than anybody else. I had the pleasure to work directly for Mr. Alan Malali. Alan was named uh, a few years ago as the best uh, business leader of the corporate America in the 21st century. When I joined the Boeing company in 1992, uh, Mr. Malali was the general manager on the Boeing 777 airplane. Later, he became uh, the president of the Boeing Commercial Airplane Group. And then later, when he was already 60 years old, Bill Ford, uh, the grandson of famous uh, Mr. Ford, who invented the first moving line, the first conveyor, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century and created the famous the automotive company, asked Malali, asked Alan, to go to Ford and save the brand. At that time, Ford was uh, a real mess. It was uh, very close to uh, go out of the phone book. Alan, in six years, not only saved the company, but many of you know that Ford today is again one of the best cars in the world. So what I learned from this gentleman is that if you uh, work as a manager on any level you need to be mindful about time and how you split your time so alan was teaching us that good managers should uh, remember that one third of their time they should think about the strategy about the future it doesn't matter on what level you work you can uh, be the first level manager or you can be the ceo of the company but you absolutely need to think about the future uh, of your team, of your organization, of your business unit, of your company. Not less important, every day you need to manage your business. Because if you don't manage your business well, there is no reason to uh, worry about the future. You can lose uh, the team, you can lose the company. But not less, probably more important, one third of your time every day you need to think about people. People who work for you, people whom you manage, not less importantly, people who uh, work uh, with you in parallel, your suppliers, your customers. And if you follow this uh, very simple rule and uh, you have a talent, you probably will be a very successful 
leader and the manager. Alan very successfully, uh, you know, and I witnessed this, applied this at Boeing on three programs that he was leading, and those programs are well known around the world. 737, 777, and 787. Next shot, please. So we'll talk a little bit today about managing modernization, managing innovation, and we also will talk a little bit about people uh, management and leadership. So let's talk about modernization first. So this is a story about uh, uh, what happened in the late 90s, last century, early 2000s, this century, uh, in Renton, State Washington, at the oldest plant uh, at the Boeing Company. Today this plant uh, produces uh, four modifications of the 737 commercial aeroplane. We produce Boeing business jet based on the 737 aeroplane, as well as the uh, military aeroplane P-8. This is the uh, aeroplane that uh, used 737 as a platform and search for submarines in the ocean. Next chart, please. So uh, that aeroplane uh, is probably one of the most successful aeroplanes in the history of aviation. You know, first time Boeing company rolled out this aeroplane almost 60 years ago. In 1969, the first 737 Classic uh, flew. Since that time, the Boeing company produced almost 5,000 of these aeroplanes. That's the most popular aeroplane in the world. Every second, uh, every two and a half seconds, somewhere in the world, this aeroplane takes off or lands. And we were leading the world in the narrow body aeroplane niche uh, very successfully until the end of the uh, 90s of the last century. What happened in uh, the late 80s of uh, the last century, the European companies created the consortium that was called Aerobus. And the first aeroplane that they made that was not very impressive, A300. And then, you know, they made the aeroplane that actually became very successful. And this aeroplane you all know, and uh, today we have duopoly with Aerobus for narrow body aeroplanes. And this aeroplane is called A320. This aeroplane uh, was uh, designed about 20 years after 737. And of course, very talented European engineers used all the lessons learned and all mistakes uh, that we've made to make their aeroplane as good as ours. They also had the luxury of big subsidies from German and French government, as well as from the governments of Spain and United Kingdom. And as a result of this, their plans uh, were more modern. And to cut the long story short, we were surprised, the Boeing company was surprised to wake up in the late 90s and begin to realize that the major airlines of the world buy more A320s than 737. In the world of commercial aviation, if you lose narrow body aeroplanes, you lose the leadership because this is the most popular aeroplane and it's also the best margin aeroplane. So uh, I was living in Seattle. I think I was the senior director for supply management of engineering at that time. And I was lucky because I was one of the students of uh, Mr. Malali. And I always attended his every week staff meetings. So that meeting, he was the president of Boeing Commercial Aeroplane Group at that time, uh, was from 8 a.m. to 12. And we went through the deck of charts that Malali created himself and that deck showed the health of uh, the company that we all managed together under his leadership. And I remember that uh, one of the days he stood up, he showed a few charts that very clearly proved that Boeing lose leadership in the narrow body aeroplane. And he had to, uh, and he had the, all of us to stand up and he asked us to shout, we are second, we are not first, we are second. Now, for some of you, you know, who are familiar with the American business culture, um, you would realize how hard it is on a, a self-confident, proud American managers. Many of the people who get to the top of the American corporations, including Boeing, 
you know, were the best at their universities, and almost all of them were very good athletes. And uh, when you are very sporty, and you are already number one, for you to admit that you are number two is very difficult. It took the courage of the leadership uh, that Malali showed at difficult times for him to recognize it itself and then convince all of us that we were really second. It was not easy, but after a couple of weeks when we uh, stood up at every staff meeting and we began to uh, shout, we are second, we began to realize that the uh, real, real disaster is very close to the Boeing company. Next shot. And uh, <clears throat> we took about two months, you know, the best people who work for Malali to study, do we have anything available inside the Boeing company or in the United States that can help us to fix this problem that we had with our European competitor? And uh, in a couple of weeks, I think, you know, in about a month, we came back to the staff meeting and we said that we don't know uh, the tools um, to fix uh, the problem with our manufacturing, our production. The problem that we had was very simple. We had one plant and Europeans had uh, three assembly lines. And when uh, the airlines began to grow, they asked uh, us, and Airbus to produce more aeroplanes, we had the limitation, just the physical limitation of one assembly line. I think, you know, uh, maximum that we could produce was 27, 28 aeroplanes. Now, Europeans could easily produce 36 because they had two, three uh, parallel assembly lines. And what happened, you know, they began to offer aeroplanes earlier than us. And of course, airlines began to prefer aeroplanes uh, that were available earlier. We asked them to wait two, three years. Europeans could deliver in one year. So we had the bottleneck in our manufacturing. And also we had a bottleneck with the cost because Europeans used the way more robotics. Remember, our plant started to produce aeroplanes in 1969 and they started in 1988. So 20 years gap gave them an opportunity to use the state-of-art robotics technology that did allow them to do the aeroplanes cheaper. So you had uh, the easiest analogy, you know, the easiest analogy is that you had uh, something that uh, is similar to choosing between two cars. You can buy very expensive, excellent, uh, well-known BMW or Mercedes, or you can buy Lexus. Lexus is available right now. You have to wait for your Mercedes, you know, for a year. And oh, by the way, your Mercedes will be about 30% more expensive. And uh, Lexus, you know, is as good as your Mercedes. Maybe a little bit uh, less known, maybe a little bit worse, but very, very good. And it's available right now. So that's what uh, was the, uh, you know, in the nutshell for the problem that we faced. So we didn't know how to fix it, you know, using American tools and processes. And Elm sent us to Japan. So we formed five teams and we went to Toyota. At that time, Toyota company was very famous because after the Second World War, they tried to recover their industry and they used the principles that Professor Deming invented in the United States long ago. They um, married these principles of uh, optimal um, uh, people management with the uh, basic principles that Ford uh, invented uh, when he uh, proposed moving line and they also uh, uh, merged it with the uh, outstanding loyalty that Japanese culture had uh, to the uh, companies that uh, Japanese people worked for. You know, in Japan, it is very, very common that you work only for one company the whole life, and your company becomes your family. So they invented something that later became uh, the uh, very well-known technology, which we call now lean. Lean manufacturing means that you optimize the flow of your production, and you continuously work every day on reducing the uh, time, improving the quality, and increasing efficiency. 
you know, I'm sure that uh, either you had the introduction to Lean or you will learn Lean, but today it's a common practice for the whole world of business. You can apply Lean in automotive industry. I will show you what we've done in aerospace, but you also can apply it in finance industry. You know, Sberbank, the largest bank in Russia, uh, applied Lean uh, in their retail business. You can also Lean your back office. It's a very, very general but very effective tool. After three months of rotation in Japan, some of the best managers working for Mr. Malali came back and we reinvented the Boeing company. Next shot, please. So we use this nine uh, tactics uh, and most of these tactics are very simple, very well known. And uh, the main thing is that you do the value stream mapping and analysis of your manufacturing and then you try to establish uh, a moving line uh, that will introduce the continuous movement of your products and that will help you to uh, create more uh, at less cost and at less time. Next shot, please. So this is how our rampant plant looked uh, before modernization. So you can see that uh, the plant was really packed and uh, before uh, uh, we implemented the moving line, you know, we just didn't have place to produce more than 28 aeroplanes. You can see that, you know, the walls uh, were there, you know, the doors were there. You can see in front of uh, yourself uh, Lake Washington. So the aeroplanes uh, were produced actually using the facility that was built during the Second World War II. And we didn't have time to build the new plan. So the maximum that we can produce using this traditional a stable production uh, uh, techniques was 28 aeroplanes per month. Next shot, please. This is how this plant looks today. So the plant can produce up to 60 aeroplanes. The same uh, facility can produce up to 60 aeroplanes. We had 28. We can produce up to 60 aeroplanes on three moving lines in the same walls. Uh, just implementing the technology that we picked up from outside, from the automotive industry, because our leader, Mr. Alan Malali, had the courage to admit that we were number two and that we didn't know ourselves how to fix the problem. So there is nothing wrong, you know, to learn from outside if you need to save your company. Next shot, please. We didn't stop on introducing lean. Today, the Boeing company introduces Lean Plus and Lean Plus 10X. Lean Plus is applying the principle of uh, optimal, most effective manufacturing to all parts of the company. You can apply it to your accounting department, you can apply it even to your HR department, of course, you can apply it to engineering. Today, Lean is one of the main tactics uh, for the Boeing company to modernize uh, every part of our business. But it's not the end of the journey. You know, we also very proudly invented, and this is the Boeing invention, uh, what we call Lean Plus 10X. This is uh, a very uh, sophisticated technology that helps you to define the tools and the process that will allow you to make the product, whether it's uh, the aeroplane or your uh, balance sheet in your finance department. 10 times faster uh, than you do today. You know, it sounds uh, very, very uh, uh, strange. You know, and some people say that it's impossible. Uh, yes, in most of the cases, it's very difficult to increase the speed of production if you already optimize to the uh, value creation uh, by a factor of 10. But there is techniques that will help the teams to find a way how to do it two, three, five times faster. I personally was leading the teams when we gave people uh, the opportunity to create something out of the box, we kept the bar very high. We asked them to think about how to do things 10 times faster or 10 times better. And in most of the cases, uh, our teams completely failed. They couldn't reach the level uh, that we asked them for. But we celebrated with them when they came up with the technologies or, or with the process that helped us to do it two, three, five times better. 
So 10x is just a notional target. Sometimes you can do even better than 10, but you need to think big and raise the bar. Next shot, please. And, uh, you know, we also uh, developed some of the very, very simple uh, checklists that, uh, you know, later on maybe you can look at and uh, maybe you can uh, learn more about uh, these technologies. If you will go to run really big business, it can be very helpful for you in future. Next. We also made a special effort to introduce the culture of quality. You know, when we uh, implemented this move line in Rantan, we began to realize that quality is something that has to be uh, in the blood of every uh, employee of the company, starting from CEO and, uh, you know, ending with the last mechanic. We made the uh, quality to be personal, and we explained to our people that quality are necessary not only because we want our products to be the best in the world, but also because in our business we have huge responsibility for the safety of the future passengers of our airliners. Next shot, please. And then we spend a lot of time developing our leaders. And uh, this is another example that I really uh, want you to remember. When we implemented Lean in, in Renton and when we worked on modernization, we began to realize that for every employee that comes to our factory or to comes to our engineering center, there is only three things that are important. One is whom you work for. If you have a good manager, you know, then you will be uh, very successful. If you trust this uh, man or woman, you know, you will be happy doing your work. If you are unlucky, and unfortunately in 50% of the cases, we don't have bad, uh, we don't have good uh, leaders. You know, then uh, that can poison your uh, everyday work. So the most important thing that we all as future leaders need to remember is that assigning manage management, you know, picking up the right leaders is the most important thing. So that probably occupies about 40% of the force of all the employees. Another 60% are split in two parts. You know, about 30% of our thoughts is about what type of work you do. So when you assign work to people, you know, remember that people in most of the cases want to grow and want to develop themselves and want to learn something new. So they would be interested to uh, do something meaningful, something, you know, something important that will help them to develop themselves. Not less important, the work environment. So if you are engineering manager, remember that uh, it's important uh, how uh, much space your engineers have, how good is air condition, how good is the lighting so they can uh, easily work on the computer eight hours. And of course this is very important for mechanics when they assemble your airplanes. Next year, please. And then finally, you know, we also uh, began to realize that only engaging employees you can uh, uh, accomplish what you want. So if you look at the uh, results of uh, modernization and rental, we had dramatic uh, factory cycle time reduction. We actually can move now up to 60 aeroplanes per month production. So the cycle time, uh, you know, was uh, reduced by a factor of two. And we have dramatic reduction in the uh, floor space and also uh, Great improvement on the quality. Next shot, please. So, what are the lessons learned from this modernization case? First of all, uh, you know, modernization happens only when uh, you have uh, um, death knocking into your window. You know, uh, modernization doesn't happen by the order. Modernization happens when uh, uh, you really, really have a majority of your leadership realizing that without this major dramatic step, because nobody likes change, everybody loves stability, and modernization is hard, but, uh, you know, it happens very quickly when there is no other way to survive. Modernization uh, can uh, come from outside. The Boeing company, one of the most proud companies in the world, learned how to modernize our rental plant 
from the automotive industry, from Toyota. Resistance will be very, very high. And uh, people don't like to change. But if you have the, the will of the leadership, you know, it's possible. Involvement of people at all levels uh, is uh, absolutely necessary. And it does take a courage. So if Alan would not uh, realize himself and uh, would not say we're second at this staff meeting, we probably uh, would be late to modernize uh, uh, that plan, catch up with our competition and provide uh, uh, the leadership of the industry for many years to come. Next chart. So this is how the uh, assembly of this uh, aeroplane is done today. Today we can literally assemble two aeroplanes per day uh, at this plant. And we didn't expand the plant, we actually shrink the plant. So if you can show the video, I would appreciate it. So the, the fuselage arrives from the uh, state Kansas, uh, and then it goes to the assembly line. They put the wings together. In parallel, they assembly the wings uh, at the special facility. And they began to install the uh, interior and uh, avionics uh, inside fuselage. So the wings are connected to the main body. Uh, they put the landing gears. This is all in the first couple of hours. And then they put the aeroplane on the moving line and the aeroplane begins to move. So aeroplane is on the moving line between five to six days, depends on the rate. Engineers and uh, business uh, support personnel works right there at the plant. The aeroplane moves uh, days and night, and uh, every minute you have people working on the aeroplane. There is three shift production, and uh, this is actually the moving line similar to what we have in automotive industry. The difference is that in automotive industry, the car has uh, maybe uh, a few dozen thousand parts, this aeroplane has uh, 3 million parts. Every part has to be certified separately because of the safety of our passengers. At one of the last positions, they put this uh, um, chairs, kitchens. And then the aeroplane goes to the painting and final chair. It takes about half a day to paint the aeroplane, which is very difficult. And then there is two flights. One is the FAA, Federal Aviation Authority of America, certification, and then the customer acceptance, and the aeroplanes leave rental. So that modernization was done in uh, less than two and a half years from the time when Malali said we're second. And since that time, uh, we never lose the leadership uh, in narrow body aeroplanes to Airbus. This is probably one of the largest examples of modernization in the uh, history of high technology. Uh, and uh, this is the example that I want you to remember because it did take courage of the leader. It did take uh, um, learning from outside, from Japan. We uh, implemented in parallel not only lean techniques, but also the, uh, we built the quality of, uh, we, the culture of quality, and we uh, went uh, to the new level of engaging our personnel. Now, uh, Lean is very popular in Russia today, so we, the Boeing company, brought Lean best practices to all our partners. So you can see the largest titanium factory in the world, the Sampo, where we implemented Lean. You can see the United Aircraft Company and the former leader of this company, uh, Mr. Pagasyan, are uh, teaching Lean at Kamsamoysk uh, on Amori uh, plant. And you can see uh, proud uh, employees of Sberbank, uh, the uh, big partner for the Boeing company because they finance our aeroplanes and they have the leasing company that buys our aeroplanes. 
we also gave them a lot of uh, master classes on lean. So lean uh, is a general philosophy that helps to make the companies better. Next chart, please. And uh, every time when we have an opportunity to present the examples of lean uh, in Seattle at our plants, we usually do it. So you can see Minister of Industry and Trade, um, Mantorov, you can see the chairman of Aeroflot, Mr. Androsov, and the chairman and CEO of Sberbank, uh, Mr. Grief, uh, at the plants um, uh, in Seattle, uh, where our employees and our engineers and myself had a, an opportunity to show the best of uh, uh, lean to our partners. Next chat, please. Okay, so this is the first story that I gave, and let's talk about the second one. So this is the story about uh, managing innovation. And after we will uh, tell you the story, I hope that the words innovation, diversification, outsource, and risks, and micromanagement uh, will uh, mean uh, more for you. Hey, you know, if you are tired, you know, uh, show me. If not, you know, I can continue. So what do you want me to do? We can make a pause or we will continue to fly. If we want, if we want to continue, you know, show like this, okay? If you want, okay, perfect. Okay, great, thank you. Fasten your bell, so we continue to fly, and now we will talk about uh, management of innovation. So this is the story about the other aeroplane, 787 aeroplane. Next chart, please. So this is the aeroplane that fundamentally changed the industry. This is the aeroplane that can carry between 200 to 300 passengers. And this is the aeroplane that first time in our history was created not from aluminum, but from composites. Uh, the materials that we use there, you know, designing and building this aeroplane is similar to the carbon fibers that you use in your tennis rockets if you play tennis or uh, in your uh, uh, downhill skis if you are fond of uh, downhill skis. So that aeroplane was very, very successful. It did beat the record on our sales. Before we showed it to the customer, uh, we actually enjoyed 850 firmed orders. Next shot, please. So the aeroplane was uh, uh, created as the breakthrough in innovation. First of all, we decided to walk away from aluminum and build it from composites and titanium. We also wanted to have the most sophisticated uh, cockpit, the most sophisticated engines, and the most sophisticated systems in the aeroplane. Next shot, please. We also didn't want to spend a dozen billions of dollars ourselves, and we divided aeroplane into many parts, and we asked our partners around the world to pick up design and produce responsibility for this aeroplane and oh by the way to commit significant multi-billion dollar investment in the facilities to build this aeroplane. For example, the major sections of this aeroplane and the wings we produce in Japan. The Japanese government subsidized Mitsubishi heavy industry, Kawasaki heavy industry uh, and uh, they built the plants and the new huge uh, equipment uh, to uh, build our wings and our uh, fuselage sections. You know, the similar investments were done by uh, Vought and Spirit companies in the uh, US. So to cut the long story short, the aeroplane was uh, uh, proposed as a breakthrough in technology but also a breakthrough in uh, business model. That was the first time when we began to work on what we call the risk sharing business model. Next shot, please. And that aeroplane, uh, we announced in 2002, we showed it to the world in 2007. And the plan was to first time fly in 2008 to the Beijing uh, Olympics. Our salespeople told us that if we would be able to show the aeroplane bringing passengers on the scheduled flight to Beijing, that aeroplane will have successful sales for 
30 years to come. That was the first aeroplane, commercial aeroplane, in the history of the Boeing company that we did not deliver on time. We embarrassed ourselves in 2008, telling the world that we cannot meet our hard commitment to our launch customers. And the first customers that were affected were the Great Japan Airlines, ANA, and JAL. Now, we were thinking that because we had at that time experience with modernization, we can, we can uh, use the same teams of leaders and we will uh, be late, but not for a long time. We did hope that we will uh, deliver in 2009. Well, in 2009, we surprised the world second time. And then six times, six times the Boeing company embarrassed itself, telling the world that we cannot deliver this aeroplane. We delivered it only in 2012, four years later. Today, this aeroplane, without a doubt, is the most successful commercial wide-body aeroplane. We produce 12 of them per month. But what happened in 2004, 2005? Why did we fail? Next shot, please. So, before I will tell you what happened, you know, I want to tell you uh, how the world reacted. So Boeing had, uh, at that time, almost 90 years of history to be the great supplier of the aeroplanes. But uh, airlines and mass media didn't have any mercy. So see, you know, the titles of some of the newspapers. You know, Boeing failed, Boeing delayed again, Boeing uh, would never fly the Dreamliner. Next shot, please. And uh, the investors did not forgive Boeing. The Boeing stock went from almost $100 to $28. The capitalization of the Boeing company at that time was so low that our neighbor in Seattle, the company called Microsoft, that was at the peak of their uh, business success, that year could easily buy Boeing. At that time, Microsoft capitalization was very high, and Boeing capitalization went down by a factor of four, and they approximately uh, paid uh, for Nokia a few years ago when they bought the telephone producer from uh, Scandinavia, Nokia, Microsoft did, approximately the same that the Boeing company did cost at that time. So that was really, really bad. The failure happened because uh, there were too much innovation that we introduced into this aeroplane. We introduced a lot of engineering new ideas, a lot of business ideas, and the complexity of cross-coordination was uh, beyond our ability to manage. So the main lesson that I want you to remember is that innovation is great, but don't try to innovate uh, at once um, many things. Innovate uh, continuously instead of trying to put together the best that you know and begin to manage it all at once, especially if you don't have the infrastructure to control the interfaces or manage big, complex, innovative projects. And that's the main lesson that we learned. Now, what is really interesting, you know, how did we fix the problem? We went into what uh, uh, People in Russia really well understand. We built the vertical and we began to control every step from the very top. You know, it was actually controlled by hand for a few years by the best Boeing leaders that left Seattle and went to Japan, to Italy, to our American suppliers, and for a while took over their companies, well, took over their production facilities uh, that worked for 787, because the main problem that we have was not at Boeing, the main problem uh, was uh, at our suppliers, whom we delegated too much. Next, please. And, uh, you know, when we uh, had the 787 uh, uh, disaster recovery, you know, we used uh, the tools that uh, actually sometimes used uh, by the governments of the countries, you know, to control uh, the 
recovery of the economy. Uh, we had uh, the best uh, managers go uh, very close to where uh, the production problems are, and these managers reported directly to our leaders daily uh, the recovery plan, and we had daily control. Next shot, please. Now, what is good about this principle is that uh, you can fix the problem, but you cannot manage it, you know, for a long time. Because uh, when you go into this micromanagement, vertically controlled uh, structure, you begin to spend not a third of your time, but you begin to spend 90% of your time for managing everyday pro problems. And you violate the principle that Mr. Malali uh, invented and shared with us, uh, and I described it at the beginning. You begin to lose on strategy and you don't have time to manage your people. So if you have the disaster like we had with 787 and your um, plan fails, you can use the micromanagement, you can use uh, the vertically structured um, management process, but please don't do it for a long time because then you will lose on the strategic thinking and you will lose on people. Next shot, please. But you know, but uh, that was a, a very, very interesting case when the Boeing company failed and recovered and we would never uh, have a similar situation again because uh, our airplanes are too uh, expensive and too responsible. Uh, and uh, the result was by the end of the day good. It took us three years to recover, but the Boeing uh, stock went to $150 and we actually doubled the capitalization of our company from the best times before 787. And uh, look how beautiful this airplane today. Next uh, video, please. This is the best uh, wide-body aeroplane in the history of civil aviation. Made from composites and Russian titanium, it can carry between 220 to 280 passengers. It does have uh, uh, electrical drives, almost no hydraulics. It has the best engines in the world. It is very, very comfortable because the composite aeroplane can fly you for 18 hours with uh, almost uh, the same pressure as on the ground and the same humidity on the ground and this aeroplane really changed the world and uh, it's the best example of innovation the problem that we had is that we put too much uh, from technology and business uh, uh, model into this uh, product and we didn't have uh, the structure and people to manage it we fixed it using the best management techniques uh, from our Renton factory, focusing on quality, cultural quality, focusing on uh, employee engagement, and assigning the right leaders. It took us almost 1,000 days. And in between, we were very close to lose the company. So the price for failure in innovation is very, very high. The reward is wonderful. Today, we produce 12 aeroplanes a month, 144 aeroplanes, and we sold out for 2020. The world wants to fly this aeroplane. It's beautiful, it's affordable, it's comfortable, it has the longest range and the best comfort. Now, Guys, what I'm really proud of is that, that that aeroplane wouldn't happen without Russia. I had almost 1,200, 1,200 Russian engineers designing the nose section of this aeroplane. And also, 50% of all titanium parts, 22 tons of forgings on this aeroplane made from Russian titanium produced by the joint venture that we built with SM4, Visma, and Rossia in Europe. This joint venture called Ural Boeing Manufacturing. And despite of all political problems that we have occasionally between Russia and the United States, that plant played a major role in the success of this program. We are going to expand this plant. So 
That's the second story that I wanted to tell you about uh, managing innovation. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the third thing. Uh, well, let me make a conclusion. So, uh, <clears throat> Professor Mao asked me, you know, I called Vladimir yesterday and he asked me to tell you about what I learned from Boeing managing modernization and managing innovation. So I put these slides together, you know, for you. Uh, and uh, I want to make uh, a short uh, summary. So uh, the main conclusion on modernization is uh, we went from 28 aeroplanes to 46 that we produce now with the ability to produce in less than uh, three years using lean techniques engaging people, focusing on quality and leadership. What I learned is that stability and predictability in the change of this scale is way more important than emotion and jump. Revolution is risky. Stable, uh, continuous improvement with a good strategy uh, is a way, way, better, uh, way better technology. Next chart, please. Stability and predictability helped us to build the best production system for narrow body aeroplane. It saved our 787 program and it will be our future for the next uh, aeroplane that we are designing and building right now called 777X. Next. And uh, the tools that we uh, implemented, lean quality management system and in-play engagement, they are more or less universal tools because when we found ourselves in deep yogurt on 787 disaster, we didn't have anything else. We went to the basics of management that we built on the lean practices, on the culture of quality, on employee engagement, and it helped us to recover one of the most challenging uh, tasks in the history of Boeing that was the delay of Boeing 787 Dreamliner. Next chart, please. Now let's talk about the most important element of management, and this is people and leadership. Next. So in 1996, Boeing uh, merged with McDonnell Douglas, and a little bit later we bought Rockwell and Hughes, and we became the largest aerospace company in the world. Next. A few years later, the Boeing company was embarrassed with a few ethical and uh, uh, corruption scandals. We looked at the root cause of this uh, problem and we found out, next chart please, that uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, through the merger with different companies, we didn't build one culture and one morale. And because of this, Alan Mulally, my teacher and the person who was ready at that time to become the chairman and CEO of the Boeing company, was not selected by the Boeing board to lead the company. And that's why Alan, at the age of 60, left after he was the president of Boeing Commercial Aeroplane Group and after he was the president of Boeing Defense and Space Group, he left and uh, made the second career and changed the fourth company. And the guy from outside came, his name was Jim McNerney. And Jim uh, was leading the Boeing company for 10 years. The reason was that through the major consolidation, the Boeing company uh, began to realize that we are fighting inside the new company between cultures of McDonnell Douglas, Rockwell, Hughes, Boeing. And Alan was born at Boeing, raised at Boeing, and the board didn't want the leader even the strongest leader of one company to lead the combined big company. So it was a tragedy for Alan, uh, but it was necessary to do because only the person from outside can change uh, the management practices if the company is not healthy. So the scandals uh, that we had, either the ethical scandals or corruption scandals at that time, did cost us a lot of business and a lot of embarrassment. And one of the major lessons that I want you to take away from this lecture is that if you go through the major consolidation, uh, sometimes it's possible, but in many cases, it's very difficult to keep the leadership of one company to be responsible for the consolidated uh, structure. 
And that's why uh, Jim McNerney, uh, the guy who was at that time the chairman and CEO of the 3M company, and before that he was the leader of General Electric uh, business unit called the uh, GE Engines, came to Boeing and he changed the way uh, we manage and the way we train our leaders. Next shot, please. So uh, when Jim came, you know, he looked at Boeing and he said, we need to go back to basics. We need to explain to all people working at the company what the management model is about, we need to define very clearly uh, the values and we need to focus on leadership. And he used the analogy that uh, we actually uh, all understood. He said that uh, we need to make leaders at the Boeing company like we make airplanes on the moving line. We need to develop a system of training leaders because better leaders make better companies. It's that simple. And the leadership begins at the top. Next shot, please. So, uh, next shot. Next shot. So what he did, you know, he created a very simple chart that all of you will understand because it's the basics of business management, how we create the value to the company. That chart uh, for 10 years uh, was on the table of every manager of the Boeing company because the task was to find your a dot on this chart and first of all explain yourself and then go and explain your people your teams where are you on this chart are you responsible for growth selling our aeroplanes or are you responsible for productivity building our aeroplanes at continuously lower cost you work with our investors you're responsible for our financial performance or you deal with our employees being our, our HR or our supply management leader Next shot, please. Then he hired from outside the most expensive HR professional. That guy made his name as a transformational agent in uh, people uh, management. He worked for us for eight years. His name is Alan May. At that time, he came uh, after a fabulous career with uh, PepsiCo, Caterpillar, TRW. He made a big difference at Boeing, and now he is the senior vice president for HP. Mac Whitman, whom I personally know, the great leader of HP, Hewlett Packard Company, who created eBay before, uh, bought Alan, you know, paid a lot of money to hire him away from Boeing because he uh, is the best leader for uh, HR transformation, and that's what he did at Boeing, and that's what he is doing at HP right now when Mac Whitman goes through the major transformation of Hewlett Packard. Next shot. So what Alan did, you know, Alan went to basics and he uh, began to explain to our employees that uh, we will reward only the top performers uh, of the company, uh, focusing on direct pay incentive benefits and also all the perks. Next. Then he uh, developed very clear techniques how to define the best talent, how to develop the best talent, how to show every manager and every employee a very clear career path and have the, the real milestones for the leadership. And then how to be very objective, not emotional, on individual goals. And then he implemented, you know, 360 surveys that gives you the view on uh, leadership performance from the top, from the bottom, and from the side. Next. You know, this is the typical HR cycle. You know, when you will begin to manage people, you will do it yourself or you will uh, be uh, somebody who will be inside the cycle because your managers will do it with uh, yourself. So uh, what Alan suggested and Jim approved that instead of three step cycle, when you set expectations, you evaluate and then you reward the performance or you punish for bad performance, you will introduce two uh, very important steps. In the middle of the year, you need to have uh, the feedback, and that's how we assign to our leaders observers and coaches, and you need to have a continuous feedback. So observe and coach and provide feedback. That was the invention that we uh, had to implement to mix the cultures of Boeing, McDonnell, Douglas, Rockwell, and Hughes. Next shot, please. 
we focused only on 10% of our people. And this is the people who manage the company. This is the people who uh, have responsibility to manage the project or to manage people. We call them managers. Next chart, please. And then we uh, said that uh, only our leaders can teach the next generation of leaders. And that was also very powerful because before we hired consultants or we hired professors from the universities to teach our leaders. Today we have our vice presidents and directors to teach at our corporate university and our training courses. Next chart, please. And we also developed a very special system when all our leaders go through the formal training and they continuously learn. They learn at work, they learn from their peers, and they learn at our corporate university. Next chart, please. We built and developed one of the best universities uh, in the corporate America, and maybe in the world, that we uh, call the crossroads of the Boeing company. Next chart, please. This is how it looks like. Every manager has to go every year, at least once, for a few days, sometimes for a few weeks for the retraining at this university. If uh, some of you will go and work for the uh, Sberbank, you will be surprised how similar the corporate university that Gref built outside of Moscow, because he learned from Boeing, uh, making a lot of trips, and he fully implemented at Sberbank uh, the uh, technique that we call leaders teaching leaders. Next chart, please. Next chart. And the final video. This is the video that shows you the value of corporate uh, education. And uh, this is the video that we made uh, uh, a few years ago. Can you see the video?
So let me make a summary, so one minute summary. So what I want you to take away from this masterclass. Uh, I told you the story of the large scale modernization at our Renton factory when we moved to the moving line uh, in our 737 production from 28 aeroplanes to 60 aeroplanes. Dramatically improved the quality, dramatically improved the employee morale. I told you the story about the success failure and success of 787 Dreamliner. We not very often tell this story, but I know I wanted to be very honest with you that innovation is uh, extremely important, but it's also very risky. And I also wanted to give you uh, some of the best people management and leadership development practices. Next shot, please. So what is amazing that if you think about modernization and about innovation, the tools are actually the same you need to learn these tools if you want to become good uh, leaders uh, for small, medium size or big companies. And these tools about optimal uh, process management lean, about your commitment to quality and about your commitment to uh, employee engagement. Uh, outside leaders sometimes are extremely valuable if you don't have uh, tradition or environment to fix the problem from inside. Jim McNerney became an outside leader to save Boeing. Alan Mulally, my teacher, became an outside leader to save Ford. After they finished their fantastic decades, the Boeing company stock quadrupled and the Ford company stock was increased by a factor of six. So both of these great leaders whom I had an opportunity to learn from, next chart please, they always focused on lean, on quality, on employee engagement, but more importantly, on developing and assigning the right leaders. Remember, you know, what we learned from Alan, everybody who worked for us or ourselves when we work for somebody, first of all, think about whom we work for. So innovation, work environment, Type of work is very important, but nothing is more important than uh, finding the right leader. For that, you need to attract leaders, you need to train them, you need to inspire them and continuously develop them. Thank you very much for your attention. I apologize that I uh, was 10 minutes late, but I finished on time. Great. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions, so please raise your hands. Um... Thank you very much for the lecture. My name is Ali Khalid. I'm from Nigeria. I study in the Kazan Aviation Institute. And I have a couple of uh, questions. Among, this, among the series of problems encountered by the 787 Dreamliner, latest is the icing problem. The Federal Aviation Ad uh, Administration Authority in the USA issued an instruction to carry out an urgent uh, fix when one of the two engines in the on the plane of Japan Airlines 787 shot down in mid-flight. Uh, the question is, how, how far, is, because they have a deadline to the first week of October, I think, do you think the Boeing company can uh, beat up the time? That's the first question. And the second question is how you deal with the flutter effect during flight. Thank you. What, what effect? The first question is the deadline. Is the deadline... Oh, I understand the first, I understand the first question. What was... The second, the second question. The second question about the flutter, flutter effect during flight. Flutter. The, yeah, thank you. Flutter. Listen, you know, I'm a professor of aerospace structures. The flutter and buffer uh, are two uh, phenomena related to the self excitation of oscillation of the wing that are fundamental uh, for any aeroplane. So the world learned how to deal with flutter and buffer, you know, probably 100 years ago. 
So I can assure you that any of our aeroplanes, they don't have flutter and buffer. I'm uh, happy that you know about this, but it's the basics, you know. So don't be afraid to uh, fly commercial aeroplanes, not only Boeing, but any aeroplanes. You know, the engineers learned long ago how to avoid flutter. Uh, you know, in terms of engines, you know, uh, and you know, probably a few years ago you heard the problems with our batteries on 787. You know, there is always problems, you know, Airbus for a year have a problem with A320 Neo Pratt Whitney engines. The standard of our industry is 100% commitment to the safety of the passengers. Doesn't matter what the business objective is, we will not fly aeroplane. We, the industry, will not fly the aeroplane. And the regulators, the aviation authority of the United States or Russia or, you know, uh, any country would not allow us to fly aeroplane because safety is first. So whatever issue is, you know, that can be a small issue or a significant issue, you know, it will be fixed. So, and it will take as much time as necessary to make sure that people who walk into the aeroplane are completely safe. So I have no doubt that the issue with the engines for Japan Airlines for ANA will be fixed like uh, the issues with the uh, batteries were fixed before. But good questions. I didn't know that I have colleagues and professionals. I would be more careful, you know, telling you, telling you the stories. We'll uh -huh. give you more details. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Next question. Please raise your hand. I can hear you. I would like to thank you for your speech. Uh, I'm Barbara and I'm from Slovakia. Uh, I would like to ask what was the most valuable opportunity uh, that you got in your life that helped you in managing your leadership skills? And uh, the other question is how can we learn how to understand the others? Thank you. Well, you know, the uh, most valuable opportunity for me was uh, uh, 27 years ago when uh, my wife gave birth to my uh, to my son so I became a, uh, a better manager you know uh, as human responsibility not only as a husband but as a father at the same time so that was uh, probably the best uh, and most memorable management experience but um, uh, seriously you know uh, joke aside you know I think uh, both of these cases I lived through so the reason I uh, was so passionate and maybe a little bit emotional telling you my both stories because I was uh, with Malali on uh, uh, 737 uh, modernization journey. I was one of his few officers uh, that he selected and we were working days and nights to uh, uh, modernize Renton. So that was very, very important experience. And then, you know, from the very beginning I was on the leadership team for 787, so 787 story, the dream uh, liner, uh, success, failure, fix and failure, innovation is very complex, learning from, uh, from the uh, mistakes and uh, moving to a big success of the program was also a very valuable experience. So I picked up these two stories for the reason, because I think they are the best uh, things that happened in my professional career so far. Thank you. Great, and I think the last question, raise your hands. Uh, okay, do the girls. Hey, I was late, can we take two more? Since it's my lecture, you know, can we take two more? Not the last, but two more. Okay. Uh, good evening, um, sorry, good afternoon. Thank you very much for your lecture. I would like to ask one question about the report uh, which, uh, which make your management managers today, because I don't understand how you motivate to think about the strategy of the whole company. Because, uh, for example, I become a manager, for what reason should I do uh, of the strategy of the whole company? Because we usually have a, uh, only one motivation, it's the salary. In this case, how you do it? Thank you. Well, you know, compensation is definitely very, very important, but, you know, uh, remember when I told, told you what our surveys showed, you know, our surveys showed that, uh, um, 
environment in general and the type of work are very important too. So when I uh, uh, do my performance management with my direct reports, I always ask them, uh, you know, what they do to make the work environment or the work type more interesting, more encouraging the work environment better for our employees. So compensation is very, very important, but type of work that you assign to people, the opportunity for them to learn, to self-develop, uh, is uh, sometimes, you know, for, uh, for young, aggressive people, you know, is probably more important. And the environment, you know, uh, ergonomics, uh, comfort, uh, where you do your work, very important. This is the second part of your question. The first part of your question is a very good one. So if you are a first level manager, how you can contribute to the strategy of the company? And that's a leadership responsibility. So uh, in today, uh, 21st uh, century reality, you need to cascade very quickly the strategy from the very top to the bottom. And it's the talent and responsibility of the manager to translate the high level objectives that your CEO your president or your vice president uh, have uh, to the concrete uh, sub-strategies, if you will, that your team will develop to support the high-level objectives. So what we do, we go through the uh, routine exercises a few times per year. We have our top leader, the CEO of the company, addressing all the managers and all the employees, explaining what his objectives are, what the board expectations are, and then we cascade, we translate into a lower level what it means for us. And that's the very, very important responsibility of every leader and every manager. But it was a very good question. And I will take the last uh, question. Thank you very much. So do we have anybody who wants to ask the last question? Raise your hands, guys. Sure, we have some minutes to uh, with Lisa. Um, hello, my name is Kenneth. I'm from Nigeria. Uh, my question is, uh, we all know that uh, Boeing, along with Lockheed Martin, are uh, the chief uh, producers of military aircraft for the U.S. defense. So, uh, but then it is very much obvious that Lockheed Martin is leading in this area. So, uh, Boeing, I think it's more concentrated in the commercial airline system. So, do you have any plans to probably improve in the production of military airlines, maybe to compete a bit more with uh, Lockheed Martins. Thank you. Well, you know, uh, today about 65% of our business is commercial. You know, I think that moving forward, maybe will be 70. I never worked in defense part of the company other than in commercial space. But, you know, the Boeing company is a balanced company. You know, we have very good uh, Boeing Defense and Space Group. And I think that Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, European competitors in defense business are very strong. And maybe Boeing uh, didn't win recently, you know, big uh, military airplane uh, uh, businesses. You know, others did. But there is other niches that they uh, would explore. It could be commercial space, satellite business, uh, you know, homeland security, uh, aerospace, IT security, a lot of different niches that they work in. You know, Boeing, for instance, is the very big producer of helicopters, Chinook, the flying uh, bus, very famous Boeing helicopter. So I think, you know, this part of the company does have a future, but you're absolutely right. It probably will be one third of the whole company. Listen, you know, I really, really uh, want to thank you for your attention. I know that uh, my English is not perfect. I know that I probably spoke uh, too fast, uh, but I'm not a professional professor. I'm just a practitioner, you know, uh, managing a business for 25 years with my teams. And I always very much inspired. I get a lot of energy when I have an opportunity like today to see people so young, so motivated, with so good uh, eyes, and I want to wish every uh, uh, student of this wonderful uh, class a big success, and I also want to wish you good health and all the best to your families and your significant others. 
and good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful lecture. It was really a pleasure to talk. Thank you. Okay, guys. Thank you, Sugei. Good luck. Goodbye. Goodbye. So, uh, that was, I think, the best way to conclude, you know, the lecturing side of uh, the campus. And I think a lot of insights, yes, connected with your own projects. Uh, so, see you at 11 in this particular room, and we start listening to what your approach is to managing your projects.